Let's see how many get it. <clears throat> okay, the, the, the book in the Bible says you can drink coffee. Chapter 1, verse 1. Did you get it? Hebrews. There you go. That sounded like uh, fake laughter. Okay, Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. Four. Boy, that was a blessing, that song. That was a blessing. Okay, just looking at uh, an idea about how God uh, gets his words out to others. That's all we're looking at. Not going to look at the doctrine. Okay, verse 1, Hebrews, uh, God who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Okay, let's go and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words. I pray that you'd help us to be uh, people, individuals that we are are trying to pay attention to you speaking uh, in, from the multiple sources that you seem to choose. And I pray you'd help us to recognize that you do not limit yourself in how you proclaim your words, but help us to be people that have ears that are tuned to your words so we might understand your words and be faithful to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, you can see the doctrine, the title of the letter is Hebrews, so that's Jewish. And in verse 1, prophets or fathers, that's obviously Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, all through the Old Testament, most of the time God spoke to them, made his words known to the Jews by the prophets. But notice he does say, who at sundry times and diverse manners. So there's all different ways you can hear God's word, okay? Right now, this is one way, okay? But this is one of many ways. So don't limit God to thinking it's only this one way. Okay, now verse 2, doctrinally, he's just jumping in the last days, so the writer has jumped into the future. Last days, you run that throughout the Bible, and that's obviously tribulation time period. And he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 2, 3, and 4, and he's going to be talking to the Jewish people, uh, during the last days, you'll find that in Hebrews 12, where he actually speaks from heaven. <clears throat> okay, but the Lord God reveals his truth, and he provides guidance to sincere people who desire it. The Lord will use various ways or methods to fulfill this task. Okay, just as God, or the Lord Jesus, during his earthly ministry, remember that he gave sight to different blind people. He did not choose the same method each time. Okay, but all of them got their sight restored to them. All different, four different methods he used. And if those four got together, they would probably argue of which was the right method, which it didn't matter. They all got to see. So that is a God of variety. A God of variety doesn't limit himself to good people to make his words known. He can use unclean people. Uh, if you're watching television, he could actually use people on the telly to give his words. I've heard a lot of them say it. Football game. I remember a guy who was a rookie quarterback, or he was just very new at it. And the, quarter, and the announcer said, boy, he get, he's under the baptism of fire. Where'd that guy come up with that idea? Okay, he was quoting scripture. He was implying scripture. Baptism of fire is somebody being thrown into hell, and he's like saying, boy, this quarterback got thrown into hell. 
Okay, and so you pick up on those common sayings, and this is how God makes his words known to people. Now, young people at Christian colleges will often talk about trying to find the will of God, like it's some mysterious thing out there. Okay, uh, they'll, what they're usually referring to is a specific calling to a specific area. Okay, that's different. There's a directive will of God that the Bible has in writing, and it's the same for everybody. Okay, the directive will of God. But there are sources, different sources, that people are surprised that God will use where God puts a thought in their head, and they will utter the thought, speak it, and that thought came from God. Doesn't matter if they're saved, doesn't matter if they're lost, it doesn't matter if they're conservative, liberal, It doesn't matter if they're straight or crooked. Okay, either way. Okay, it's the words that come out of the mouth. Now, the devil can do the same thing, where he puts thoughts in people's heads. If they utter those thoughts, that's of their free will. Again, it doesn't matter if the guy is saved or lost. It doesn't matter if he's good or bad, conservative or liberal. It matters not. Okay, it's the words that came out. The example of that is in Matthew 16, where a good man, a man that spent time with Jesus Christ, spoke by the inspiration of God when he said about Jesus Christ, you are the Christ, the Son of God, and just a few minutes later, rebuked the Christ, the Son of God, about going into Jerusalem, and Christ, the Son of God, looked at him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Same man. Okay, so the idea, I want to give you some ideas this morning about the different sources that God may use to make his words or speak his voice. A lot of times the people don't know that. Okay, a lot of times people, uh, people say, well, uh, this prophet didn't say he was speaking by inspiration, so how does he know he was? He probably didn't. He didn't know. A lot, most of them didn't say they were. So I want to show you some, several places. I'm, we might take a look at some of them. The Lord has revealed his truth through various sources. Okay, how did he do this before written revelation? Genesis chapter 15, he did it through dreams and visions. Okay, God made his knowns to Abraham, Genesis 15 verse 1, through a dream or a vision. A vision is usually if they're awake, a dream is if they're asleep. In Genesis 25, he made his words known to, uh, in Genesis 25, verse 20, to Isaac, okay, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Genesis 25, 21, Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived and then the child, children struggled together with her, and she said, if it be so, and so forth. So you notice he is asking God about some things. So God's not hidden. He's not hidden. Numbers 12, verse 6 is a verse you want to try to keep in mind. Okay, and that one said that when God makes his words known, before written revelation, he makes his words known to a man, Numbers 12, verse 6, through dreams and visions. Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, will speak unto him in a dream. Now, that doesn't mean that your dreams and my dreams are necessarily from God. They could be, they couldn't be. It could be bad pizza late at night. Okay, now we know there's two such men who were known for interpreting of dreams, Joseph and Daniel. So those are just some illustrations on the Old Testament. Dreams and visions. Does he use that method today still? Probably. He is more limited on it. In a culture where they have no Bible, probably more so. Okay, another way he spoke through angels. Okay, Genesis chapter 16, verse 9. In the Old Testament you'll find the angel of the Lord. And who that is, I don't know. Sometimes it seems to be an angel. Sometimes it seems to be appearance of Christ. I started going through the Old Testament where in the New Testament, some, I think sometime this year I might get a red letter edition of the reference Bible. And so you went through all that New Testament and find them places where Jesus Christ actually spoke and put that in red. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to put in the Old Testament in blue where God speaks. Thus says the Lord, put that in blue. 
And then I asked the pr- publisher about it. He said, then we got three colors. We only do two colors. I said, okay, you scrap that idea. Let's just do it, and I'll put it on a PDF. So if somebody wants it on a PDF. So then I came across the angel of the Lord. Who's that? And so I put that in orange. So I got the angel of the Lord in orange, and thus said the Lord in blue, and thus said the Holy Ghost in green. So I got that one going on. Okay, and so as I'm going through there, I'm into Second Chronicles, and I'm going through First and Second Samuel, and I thought, man, look at here, how the, this guy asked the Lord about this, and this one asked about that, and this one asked about that, and, and a lesson came out of that. So in Genesis 16, verse 9, was an angel that showed up and talked to Hagar after Sarah booted her out. And notice this angel spoke to her. Okay, so it doesn't give the name. It's not Clarence. I don't know if it is Clarence. I don't think he was around at that time. Uh, Genesis 16, 9, the angel of the Lord said unto her and then told her some things. So that's one way God got a message to her. In Exodus 20, you have another thing coming along here in Exodus 20, Moses and the Israelites, and God gave Moses the Ark of the Covenant. He gave him a Urim and Thummim, which is a very strange thing, which would be nice to have if you want to know the future, Urim and Thummim, just ask him. It's like the, the bat phone. Okay, and uh, so then God made his words known to Moses through the Urim and Thummim or the Ark of the Covenant where God actually spoke to Moses directly. So he was kind of like a mediator for the nation of Israel. So he'd go on a mountain and God would tell him his words and he'd come back down. And then the Ten Commandments, God just uttered that verbally. And that scared those Jews to death, scared them to death. And they said, hey, we don't want him talking to us anymore. Have him talk to you, and then you talk to us. Okay, so that was a method he chose for Israel through Moses and Aaron. Exodus chapter 20, verse 19 and 20. Well, then Moses passes off the scene. You still have the Ark of the Covenant. And in Joshua chapter 7, verse 10, Joshua inquired to the Lord. And a lot of times they got their answers through the Ark of the Covenant. Now, this was after the battle with Ai. Okay, that, that small town that you spell its name every time you say it. Okay, and in Joshua 7, verse 10, Joshua was trying to get a reason why 36 men died in battle. And so he's praying and praying, Lord, why this happened? Why this happened? Joshua 7, 10, the Lord said unto Joshua, get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus on thy face? <laughs> well, I, I, I was trying to get an answer. Well, get up. And here's the answer. So he, he got it directly. And that was through the Ark of the Covenant also. And then you go through the next book, Judges, and God used 13 different judges to make his words known to a society that were secular humanist through the book of Judges. And then the last judge was a guy named Samuel, 1 Samuel. And then they said to Samuel, we don't want this judge stuff anymore. We want a king. And, and God told Samuel, I want you to protest about this and tell him what the king's going to do. And hopefully they'll change their mind. But they didn't change their mind. And so then they got a king. Now, he did speak through the kings on occasion, but he didn't want to do that too much because then a king tends to think he's God. So during the kingdoms, he would often speak through prophets and or priests, different means. And this is how they got direction from God. I'll give you two or three examples here. First Kings 22. Okay, this is a, a young, uh, this is a First Kings 22. This is a guy named Jehoshaphat. Skinny guy. And uh, this guy was uh, where you get the common phrase, jumping Jehoshaphat. It comes from him. And he was going to go to battle, and he was with Ahab. Ahab was a bad guy, Ahab and Jezebel. And they were going to go to battle together, which Jehoshaphat should not have been doing, but oh well, that's what happened. And Ahab had all these fake prophets come in. And said, go ahead and win, and win, you're going to win, you're going to win. And then Jehoshaphat, with him, it just didn't ring, sound right. He said, don't you have a prophet here? 2 Kings 22, verse 4. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people is thy people, my horse is thy horses. 
And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Okay, then the king gathered the prophets together. Those are his bought-off prophets. About 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go up against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver into the hand of the king. But that just didn't ring true to Jehoshaphat. He said, man, that sounds like an NIV. I want to get to the real thing. So he said this, Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And Ahab, the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, oh, let not the king say so. Oh, don't talk like that king. We're supposed to love everybody and be tolerant. Okay, and then when you read down through the story, God speaks through this man, Micaiah, to Jehoshaphat. And then he actually pronounced the death of Ahab. Okay, if you go a few pages later, 2 Kings chapter 3, we have another example where when a king inquired of the Lord... It was a prophet that answered him. 2 Kings 3.11. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord? And one of the king's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water in the hands of Elijah. So there's another one. There's another one. Okay, and what they would do uh, with the prophets, and God would speak to the prophet, and then he would make his words known to them. Okay, this is a common thing. Okay, and that's where you have Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Hosea, and Ezekiel. Those were the prophets that God spoke through to the people that was, the words were directed to. They would usually say something like, thus saith the Lord. In Jeremiah 37, verse 7... Zedekiah, at the end of the reign of Judah, he heard through Jeremiah, but he ignored him a lot of times. Jeremiah 37, 7, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, thus shall you say to the king of Judah that sent you unto me to inquire of me. And then it was about the issue of the day. Okay, so a prophet was one way they got the words. Another way were the Old Testament priests. You'll find that in 2 Kings chapter 22, that's with a guy named Jehu. No, I'm sorry, Josiah. Josiah, this, this is another fellow. And so what they would do is a priest would have his breastplate, and it has 12 stones on there, each stone represented of the tribe of Israel. And they could actually, and then he had this little Urim and Thummim. It was like a, it was like a direct line. No, no uh, long distance calling. You ever hear these liberals when they pray? It's our father, Abraham, all this stuff. That's okay. That, that's no problem. They have to do that because they got to call long distance. They got to go through all this long distance calling, push all these buttons. Where when you're in the family, you go right to the throne and say, Abba, Father. That's a better direct line. Okay, so jo Josiah, he got an answer from God through the priest, and the reason why God said, I'm giving you this answer because Josiah has a heart that's tender towards me. That's why I did that. Now, some of the, some of the kings did not like what they were going to get from God, so they tried an alternative method. And this is what most of them do. 2 Kings 1 verse 6 is they consult with witches, astrologers, Okay, and things like that. <clears throat> okay, so 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 6. This guy, one guy was sick, this king was sick, and he was trying to find out if he's going to get better. And so he inquired of Beelzebub, chapter 1, verse 1, or verse 2, you see that. Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. So he's, he's skipping God. He's going to a medium. And as he was going to the medium, Elisha found, or Elijah found out about it. God gave him a direct line to this. He said, how does he do that? I don't know. There's some strange ways. <laughs> 
Okay, and then in verse 5, And when the messengers turned back at him, he said unto them, Why are you not tur why are you turned back? And they said, There came a man up to meet us and said unto us, Go turn again to the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sentest to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shall surely die. That's an encouraging thing. Okay, and that was Elisha, or Elijah, and then when you read down through it, the guy says, what, what does the guy look like? Was he hairy? Oh, that was Elijah. Okay, so that's how they got their words known to him. Okay, King Saul, he tried to get an answer from God, 1 Samuel chapter 28, and God ignored him. Okay, the first king of Israel, he started off good, ended up bad, and in 1 Samuel chapter 28, He's trying to get an answer from God, 1 Samuel 28, verse 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. And then he went to a witch. And boy, when he did that, boy, did God get upset. Okay, now in 2 Chronicles 35, Jehu, or Josiah, the guy that I said was a good man, that consulted priest, at the end of his life, he did something very bad. And he, God gave the words to him, 2 Chronicles 35, through an unrighteous man, we could say unsaved man. And it says clearly in 2 Chronicles 35, verse 20 24, that the words of God came through this guy, but Josiah rejected it because he didn't think that guy could speak by the words of God. You'd be surprised who God uses. Even a blind squirrel can find an acorn once in a while. And so you might be surprised. Now in 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman had leprosy and God gave him words through a little girl. So kids, often little innocent children are ones that can say words that just, oh, it just digs into the heart of their grandparents when they hit a chord. And they get away with it. Now, if you or I would say it, they'd get mad. But when the little one says it, it's like, ouch. And God in heaven, when this person rejects the word from the little child, God is going to hold them into account for that. In Numbers 22, God spoke through a Democrat to Balaam. It was a donkey. He spoke through an animal. His words were made known. Now... After David passed away, Solomon established a Jewish temple, and that's how God's words came through the Jewish temple. And then Israel passes off the scene, and you get into Matthew, now the words came through Jesus Christ directly, and then through his apostles. And then specifically the apostle Paul, Romans chapter 11. So that's how, those are very, there's other ways, other means he does this, but those are the ways throughout the Old Testament as you see that. And don't be surprised if you really pay attention to what people say, they will be uttering the words of God unbeknownst to them if you're in tune to it. Usually it's common sayings is what they say. Now there was a king, the second king, he was called a man after God's own heart, King David. If you would, First Samuel. Now this is where I really noticed some things when I was going through here looking for God speaking, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, this man David was tagged by God to be a man after mine own heart. 1 Samuel 13, 14, but now thy kingdom shall not continue, the Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. So he's talking to Saul, I'm done with you. Sam, Samuel's talking to Saul, speaking the words of God, he said, I'm done with you. I'm going to a man who's after mine own heart. Now, this man after mine own heart was a fugitive from the law for many years. 1 Samuel chapter 23. His picture was in every post office in Israel. Everybody knew it. King Saul's trying to kill him. As he's running as a fugitive from law, 1 Samuel 23 verse 2, notice he inquired of the Lord. This is about a battle. First Samuel 23, shall I go up to smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, go, smite the Philistines, save Keilah. 
Okay, so God answered them. How did he answer them? Usually through the priest or the Urim and Thummim. Okay, it's like a thing where it would light up. Okay, and so, you know, kind of like an electronic Ouija board, I guess you could say, under the Old Testament covenant. But that was available to him. So David asked him, what do I do? God said, here's what you do. Verse 4, David inquired of the Lord yet again. The Lord answered him and said, arise, go down to Keilah. So again, he asked them. God answered him. Chapter 30, verse 6, you're going to find that this is regular in the life of David. And does not the Bible tell us to do these things? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That's not going to say he's going to talk to us. He's going to direct. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. And then you'll see that he inquired in the Lord, and the Lord answered him. In verse 8, The Lord David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake it? And he said, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake, and without fail recover all. So notice that he continually, when David asked inquirements of the Lord, God gave it to him. 1 Samuel 2, verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1, and it says, And it came to pass after that that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into the, any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. He said, Go. Chapter 5, verse 19, we see this repeatedly. 5, 19, David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up. Go, do it. Verse 23, said the same thing, inquired, what do I do? How do I fight this battle? And in verse 23, he says, sneak around the backside when you hear the sound of the going over the mulberry trees. And I'm sure David said, what is that? God says, you'll figure it out when you hear it. And so he won the battle because he inquired of the Lord. Chapter 21 of 2 Samuel. Chapter 21, verse 1 there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year. David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul, for his bloody house. And why are we not getting rain? But notice each of these times, God answered him. But you know, if you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 13, okay, this is the same, same storyline. This is the official public records of Israel, of Judah. 1 Chronicles chapter 13, if you remember the storyline, they lost the Ark of the Covenant, the Philistines had it, David got it, they captured it, they wanted to bring it back home. They wanted to put it back in its rightful place so they can inquire of God. And so they got this Ark of the Covenant, they put it on a new cart, and Uzzah and Ohio were driving the cart, and the oxen stumbled, and the, and the Ark of the Covenant rattled or shook on the Ark, Uzzah put his hand to settle it, and boom, he's dead. God killed him. First Chronicles chapter 13. Okay, so you read that. You see that uh, he dies in verse 9. And when they came under the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore, that place is called Perez uh, Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? No answer. Why didn't he answer him? There ain't no answer there. The death of Uzzah during this return of the ark, of the, but there's no answer to the question. Why did, the, why did he answer all the other questions, but he didn't answer this one? Now, two chapters later, in chapter 15, you'll see that they do bring the Ark of the Covenant back. And they bring it in the right way, in the right fashion, and they have a wonderful time, a successful time. But why did not God answer him? Because he already did. It was already in writing. He could have prevented that if he would have read what God said to do the first time. 
First Chronicles 15, David realizes, why didn't God answer me? Oh, he did already. He read through Exodus. He read through Numbers. He discovered in Exodus, you're not supposed to put that on a cart. God already told us what to do. Why would, he ha why would I expect God to repeat himself to me? Why would I expect God to specially give me insight when he's already given me the insight? You see, in 1 Chronicles, he figures it out. Verse 2, nobody should, the only ones carrying the ark are the Levites. I read, that's what God said. Well, did he tell you that mysteriously after you asked the question? No, he wrote it down. You see, a lot of times people tend to think God is to give me a special revelation. Or God is supposed to help me overcome that. He's already given us these things. Why does a person think that God is supposed to repeat himself when he's already recorded it down? What we need to do is if we're asking God for guidance, get in the book and start reading it. And as you're reading, you might discover, oh, there's what I should be doing. He's already told me. And you see, so in David's case, you know, it's like, and I know it's our temptation. Sure, I would like to, I think it would be great if I had an angel right there telling me what to do. I mean, yeah, direct from God. But you know what, if we had one, you know what we're going to do eventually? We're going to say, shut up and get out of here. Tired of you telling me what to do. So the reason, it, it appears to me that the reason why God did not answer him in 1 Chronicles 13 is because he's already came across that subject. And so that tells you and I the importance of reading the Bible. God, I want you to give me direct Message, what should I do? Now, if he answered that, he'd probably throw a Bible from heaven and hit you upside the head. Read that, stupid. Okay, he is not obligated. A lot of times these atheists, they think they're really, they're going to go out and argue with God. Like that's a real intelligent. Like one atheist goes out, argues with God, and challenges God. Because see, this atheist had a little child that died. He's mad at God. Challenges God, come out here and fight me. And he even went out during a thunderstorm and challenged God. And God didn't have, come on. And so this guy's yelling at God, and all of a sudden a little a gnat threw in his, a flew into his throat, and he choked to death on the gnat. It's like, okay, if you want to argue with him, go ahead. It's your funeral, not mine. Okay, the thing is, is God's already told us a lot of things. Read it. The, written, the third idea is this. The written word of God is God's main source of guidance in this day. It is the main source. John 16, 13 says that the spirit of truth will guide us into all truth. And so the thing to do is when a person is seeking the words of God or the truth, okay, you can pick it up from this person here. You can hear it. You can hear it here. You can hear it there and all that thing. Okay, and you can see, okay, that matches the book, so that was okay. But the Spirit of God is going to work through his words. The first man that God actually gave a book to, and he said, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. And then he reinforced that idea in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. The main source where we can get it directly from God will be through this book. Why do we expect special revelations from God? Well, if he gives that, wow, praise the Lord. <laughs> but a lot of times, it's those things that God will throw it in here and throw it in here and throw it in there. And if we're not paying attention to those little things, why is he going to show us the big things? 
Even though God picks all these different sources, in this day, the main source that he's going to give his words to us is right in front of us. It's right there, that blessed book. And it's the Spirit of God is going to be the one who guides us through this book to give us direction. And so that's the method. He chooses mainly for this age. Okay, so we'll stop there and pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us recognize and understand why you did not answer David after Uzzah died. Well, you'd already explained that. And David did the right thing. He went back to the source. He went to that Jewish law. He went to that book that you told him to hand right out. Deuteronomy or Exodus. And he discovered why things went awry that day. And when he threw your words in the mix of it, and he did according to your words, then there was a tremendous blessing. And help us recognize that our answers are in this book. Help us to make sure we understand it fully and sincerely seek after thy guidance. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed with that.